Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman, and today is June 7th, 2023. I welcome you to this edition of the STED Talk, which stands for Spine Technology Education Discovery Debate Discourse. Various things. And it's a great day today because we have um, sponsored by Curos Biosciences, uh, two great visiting professors with us, uh, Drs. Catherine Sage from the University of Michigan West in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, Dr. Chris Hofstetter, who is at the University of Washington, and he came across the street from Ninth Avenue. It's great to have him here. He's nationally, internationally renowned as an, uh, a minimally invasive surgeon, has really brought formal minimally invasive surgery uh, to a new height. As always, we're going to show a couple of cases, uh, but before we do that, we had a great um, occasion yesterday. Ben, do you want to roll the video? Um, so our chief of our spine service, Dr. Rod Eskuin, had a little special celebration. And Happy birthday, Rod. Come on up here. Come on up here. We love you, man. You had the vision for all of this. You've created this. Can't wait for the next 50 years. Thanks, Jens. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm so lucky to work here and um, have great colleagues and partners and um, you know, we truly have a special thing. So really uh, appreciate all the birthday wishes and um, look forward to another great conference. Great. Thank you all. So a special day with two visiting professors here from the University of uh, Michigan West, Dr. Catherine Sage. She's a foot and ankle surgeon, but she knows a lot about bone healing, has, has done some cool new things. And Dr. Chris Hofstetter, dear friend and um, well-known minimally invasive surgeon, and he came over from the University of Washington today across the 12th Avenue Divide. So thank you for daring that. Again, we have two cases, um, maybe three, I'm not sure, but two cases, let's start with one. And uh, that is Dr. Jared Cook. He's gonna graduate and he's gonna head out. Tell us where you're gonna head, but he's from New Mexico and he's just finished his fellowship here and he has a first case, full declaration. It's a case of mine, it's a complication. All right. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm uh, heading to Virginia Beach after this. <laughs> no, I got it. I really want this to work. Let's see. Maybe not. There we go. All right. Um, so our uh, first case uh, is a 54-year-old male um, uh, came in with low back pain, uh, radiating to the bilateral lower extremities for about three months. Um, the, uh, his MRI was uh, performed, um, you know, by his uh, by his primary doc, um, and then, uh, you know, immediately upon getting the results back, referred to complex spine. Um, so at this point, uh, no bowel bladder issues, uh, no subtle anesthesia, no weakness. Um, his medical history. Uh, consists of uh, control, well controlled type 2 diabetes, uh, does have a, a, a history of uh, liver cirrhosis, thrombocytopenia, um, and uh, BMI over 40. Um, so he comes in, uh, narrow intact, his platelets are down at 67, and uh, his uh, iron is 1.4. Um, so uh, I put the images in the you know, usual sequence, basically presents with, uh, with MRI. We get, um, uh, we see some x rays. This one was actually done. Uh, a month prior um, to him getting that MRI um, at an outside facility, and this was read as normal. Um, and, uh, you know, we can see that lucency that's kind of highlighted over here. Oh, there's the one that works in the camera. Um, so here's the, uh, here's the MRI. Um, so it's, you know, in the vertebral body, getting to the uh, posterior elements, compressing um, uh, the fecal sac, and um, uh, invading into the into the soft tissue, and so that's uh, it's L1 uh, right there. Um, on the CT, you know, we see uh, you know that it's uh, quite destructive, um, and so at this point, um, we also see that there's uh, um, there's some uh, autofusion, potentially ankylosing spondylitis going on uh, above. Uh, SIN score was calculated at uh, 13, so um, you know intermediate, and uh, you know warranting. Uh, consultation from us and at this point what we're looking at um, with his uh, unknown um, you know tumor is just his lytic lesion at L1 um, and uh, where do we go from here 
So uh, aside from the fact that it's a SINs score, not a SINs score, but that's an interesting version. Can you go back a little bit to the MRI scan? So assuming we use a SINs score, Chris, so this is the eternal discussion about how do we handle uh, neoplasia in the spine. He does not have a manifest neurology, uh, which is a small miracle. He has a best estimate, our radiologist said 80 plus percent canal compromise. He's barely functional, but he has no objective urinary retention. I forgot what his PVR is, so I would assume they're in the 200 to 250 range. Uh, this is a normal citizen. He was a teacher. He's had bad liver cirrhosis. He's a pretty large guy. We're all taught to biopsy and wait and see. And so tell us a little bit about your approach in terms of how should we stage these patients and should we wait for biopsy to come back, which in our world nowadays takes five days or longer when this uh, phenotyping and immunologic um, uh, uh, genetic testing. Um, tell us a little bit about your thoughts. So uh, a couple of things here. Um, you know, thanks for Jens for that question. Um, I think there's a couple of uh, you know issues here right now, and I like to go. Uh, I know I'm old school, but I like to know I, uh, they use the gnomes criteria here. Uh, and you know, if you look at this lesion here right now, it becomes very very clear very quickly. Uh, the lesion is lytic. It's at the um, you know the junction. Uh, he's not kyphosed over yet, but you know, given the looks on the X-ray, I think it's a question of time until he will fall over. So mechanically, I would say that's not, you know, I think that's not stable there, given that it's a junction. And the second thing is the tumor. Uh, the tumor is circumferential, Bilski three. There's no CSF that I can see uh, around the conus there, and so I think that would not be amenable for radiation only, given that there's no margins. So I think your hands are tied, uh, both from a mechanical perspective as well as from a tumor control perspective you need surgery in this case so gnomes criteria are interesting because they are multi-dimensional has a sins score been helpful is that something that you teach your uh, residents and fellows so i think for uh, for surgeons to make decisions i think the gnomes criteria are more uh you know they're, they're slightly more straightforward since criteria are really good for referring providers uh, to put it on their wall in their office. Uh, and so then they can sort of look through and sort of see when they have to refer. Um, so I think for us, uh, you know, the gnomes criteria, I think work pretty well. And I don't think since adds that much, but, um, you know, I think it's definitely a great, fantastic grading score, just not so much tailored towards the surgeons. Okay. Uh, Rod, so I'm going to share a microphone with you. I'm good. I got this. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of, um, decision-making the sin score again, Dr. Hostetter, has felt it's of limited value. We just had our, I think it was the 13th annual yeah. spine tumor symposium with uh, international participants. Uh, one criticism, is always, uh, criticism always has been that the SIN score has too large of an indeterminate section. What is your take home message? Should we just forget that and go to a multi um, faceted kind of a classification system to help us with decision making? Yeah, I personally like the SINs. Um, I know Chris talked about gnomes. Um, you know, I think <clears throat> the biomechanical aspect is a, is a big one. Um, and uh, again, most of these, like this tumor, you know, um, uh, it's going to be fairly difficult to radiate something like this. Um, and I think you're going to have to stabilize it. So I think having some biomechanical, neurologic, systemic, you know, um, classification system, it's helpful. So I, we kind of tend to use that, but uh, you know, there's, you can sort of choose what score you want. Um, um, in terms of getting other specialties to accept our form of quantifying disease burden, have we made progress in terms of getting radiologists and radiation oncologists as well as oncologists to see the uh, spine as we see it, or is that still kind of a silo effort? I mean, you've done this for 13 years now, together with Hootie Mandel, you've tried to really get into the minds of other specialties, which would be so important. Have we made progress? I mean, I think we've made a lot of progress. And, um, you know, I think between uh, stereotactic radio surgery and the minimally invasive options, you know, people like this actually do quite well. Um, but, uh, you know, it's still, um, these are difficult cases to manage. <laughs> So let's go to the case at hand. So um, there's no immediate neurologic uh, pressure. Um, the, key, the key point here is the patient is in severe pain. He can't mobilize. He's a very large man. Uh, he's thrombocytopenic, assumably largely from his liver disease. Um, he had a past history of significant alcohol abuse. He's a professional. He's very large. 
Uh, should we wait for a biopsy to come back? Do you want to get him to the OR soon? I mean, he's literally bedridden or kind of semi-recumbent. He can sit up to about 30 degrees. He's a poster child for mechanical instability of the spine. So you said it already. So mechanical stability, unless the patient has metastatic disease that is, you know, doesn't allow him a survival for a meaningful amount of time. So typically, you know, let's say a systemic disease, he has no more options, um, then, you know, that would uh, obviously need to be considered. But I think in a patient newly diagnosed with uh, clear mechanical instability, uh, which is, you know, typically expressed by this radicular pain with, with loading or twisting uh, in the junction, I think the mechanical reason alone is is reason enough to do surgery. Uh, and then he has Bilski 3, uh, which only could be treated with radiation if it's like a, uh, lymphoma or some some other um, you know uh, neoplasm that uh, is sensitive to radiation. So uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty straightforward uh, indication here. Our friend Mark Dekutowski has joined us. Um, that's a great comment. He uh, again radiographically has made a good point. Reactive sclerotic lytic lesion, homogeneous stroma. So I agree with all those. Uh, SPEP and UPEP. I think we drew the SPEP, the UPEP in our system takes about 72 hours. Um, it's not fully sclerotic, but it's uh, partially sclerotic. And again, there's no fracture at this point in time, but I want to point out again, there's at least three sides of the spinal column that are afflicted. And there's a, again, a radiologist said over 80% um, canal compromise with no CSF and right around the corner. So, um, <clears throat> So Mark also points out that mechanical instability is a bias towards surgery. Yes, but functionality of the patient is obviously the goal. So now let's ask Dr. Hofstetter. He's nationally, internationally renowned uh, for MIS surgery. This is a large patient. Uh, he is thrombocytopenic. Uh, quickly shape out how we'd approach this person uh, surgically. Again, you've identified um, a preference. I'm not going to say bias, Dr. Dekotowski, uh, towards earlier surgery rather than later. But uh, tell us what you do. Yeah, no, I think, again, uh, surgical indication is, is pretty uh, clear to me here, both mechanical as well as from a tumor perspective. Um, in a large patient like this, you could, uh, you know, do a mini open in the uh, right where the tumor is. Um, I think um, that would allow me to circumferentially uh, decompress uh, the spinal cord there. And given that the shell of the bone is still there, I think you have two options there for reconstructing the anterior column, either a, uh, an expandable cage, which I would prefer here because it's at the junction uh, with a transparticular approach, or alternatively, you could also uh, dry some cement there. Now, I think, you know, given there that there's a, the cortical wall is not intact throughout, I think there's a risk of cement leaking and you're not getting a good support. So I would be in favor of a mini open transparticular uh, corpectomy, uh, and then uh, instrumentation three above and two below probably. Probably also cement augmented because, uh, you know, I don't know what the bone quality is, but but it, it looks decent, but, you know, that's depending on, on what, what uh, you know, the torque and strength is of the screws during the implantation. Preoperative embolization <laughs> L1 area, is that beneficial in a possibly vascular lesion? It is beneficial, um, but, um, you know, I think we have no idea what it is. I mean, unless you have a, uh, it, you see flow voids on the MRI, so sometimes it, you can assess and have an estimate, you know, how vascular lesion is on the MRI by seeing large flow voids. Um, if that's the case, uh, it could be considered. Um, otherwise, uh, if there's no high suspicion, I would not. So, Jared, tell us a little bit about staging for oncologic patients uh, who have come in. So, just in a nutshell, what do we do? What have you learned over your time here with us? Uh, so, what we'll do when we, you know, when we see, you know, someone with a, a you know, tumor, metastatic tumor, uh, unknown origin, um, get a, a full, um, a full neuroaxial um, uh, MRI uh, with and without contrast, do CT abdomen, pelvis, or uh, chest, abdomen, pelvis. Um, and then, you know, of course, the you know, lab workup, like you said, about the, uh, um, you know, an SPEP. Um, so that's, you know, kind of the standard first things that we, you know, that we do there. So, yeah, so neural axis MRI scan, preferably with and without contrast, a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis from an imaging perspective. There may be other uh, CTs added depending upon a clinical exam. Uh, we usually get a dedicated CT if there's a um, question of a specific anatomic region to have a better resolution on the spine lesion beyond the chest, abdomen, pelvis CT. And uh, serologically, we 
uh, get SPEPs. Obviously, we get a number of markers, but one of the key things also, and that goes into the NOMS criteria, is to look at the basic uh, metabolic panel mm -hmm. or expanded one to look at the albumin because the albumin is a stratifier for infection and viability. Um, uh, do you know what the critical threshold was? Uh, 3.2 uh, milligrams oh, per deciliter. Yeah. Okay. But that doesn't mean you don't do surgery, but the risks um, rise dramatically. So, um, Dr. Hofstetter said two above or three, two below. Tell us what I did. All right. So, um, all right. So we decided on a, a two stage. So we got all we got all that uh, that work up. Um, then uh, uh, cemented uh, fixation uh, above and below. So went um, uh, two up, one down. And then uh, lateral corpectomy um, of uh, of L one a week later. Um, through the rest of the work up, it was uh, you know shown that it was likely hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, you know, just based on uh, on that uh, CT uh, chest abdomen and pelvis, um, and uh, so from here, a couple days, uh, you know, a couple days later, he's working on physical therapy. Um, yeah. So know. just go back one thing. So again, um, this was done deliberately because this patient actually was quite uh, hemorrhagic despite best attempts. So we had to do a very careful dissection. Uh, in retrospect, I'm particularly unhappy with my lower screws. I usually like to do bicortical, very large caliber screws. We did cement them. Not sure about the cement fill on the vertebra. Um, we've been lucky with that, maybe, um, uh, because we've used very large footprint cages that Dr. Skouin, who is one of the masters of far lateral surgery, has done. Rod, tell us a little bit about um, uh, far lateral surgery and the cage size that we can do in mechanical compromise to try to offload our posterior construct. Uh, yeah, so um, we went laterally and the bone was very soft, but we were, we were able to get um, plant there and, um, you know, with these newer implants, you get pretty good end plate coverage, but with cancer cases, the bone tends to be a little bit lytic, like in this case. So we could see the end plate, um, especially the uh, end plate below was not the um, uh, most, um, you know, was we could see that there was tumor there, so. So let's, um, so we'll revisit the mechanical things. We see the failure mechanism emerging. Before we go into that, our visiting professor, Dr. Sage. So, Okay, tell us about bone healing and oncologic patients. I know you foot an ankle surgeon, you do some orthopedic trauma. In the oncologic world, especially in the spine, we will face radiation um, in pretty substantial doses, uh, either through uh, single beam or external beam radiation. Usually uh, we do have cyber knife capabilities here also, which are pretty cool, but still there'll be a lot of um, grays put into that area so bone healing and until oncologic patients uh, what principles to apply autograft is out yeah what should we consider yeah it's a tricky one you're right um because as you said autograft is not your best choice here you don't want to seed any um any oncologic cells into a new site um something like a growth factor that could possibly potentiate a new cell line that could be an oncologic cell line also um you know not a great choice I think, you know, a lot of people are looking for fill here um, and just kind of going for that osteoconductive scaffold, but ideally there would, you know, also be a, a, some, some part of osteoinductivity in a bone graft that you put in in this, in this area because you do want to, you know, you have a patient who's um, going to be a, a tricky patient to heal, so you, you want to make sure that you have that osteoinductive capability. Um, and so, yeah, you're looking for an osteoconductive bone graft, you're looking for an osteoinductive bone graft, you're looking for a bone graft that's not going to perpetuate an oncologic cell line. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question that I think a lot of us struggle with. So uh, you're going to talk about a, um, is it a product or is it a, a device philosophy? Is it, uh, how, how do you categorize this uh, new bone graft alternative you're going to talk about? Yeah, so it is a product. It's a bone graft. Um, it is a bone graft that's predicated on surface topography. So we've seen in the literature through the past several years how a surface topography and hardware can modulate bone growth. Um, lots of studies in terms of like rough and titanium and, and different um, you know, different ceramics as well that can sort of induce this osteoinductive pathway. 
And so um, Curos Biosciences has a bone graft with advanced surface topography, which um, can modulate an osteoinductive pathway um, through polarization of M2 macrophages, which are very involved in a bony induction pathway. So I'm, I'm always kind of a picky guy with words. So there's a lot of words flown around. So I was always trained in categorical thinking, maybe too much so. I was uh, kind of trained in conductive, inductive, et cetera. So you kind Ingenic, of said, yeah. Yeah, so you kind of said like inductive or, I mean, wh wh there were a lot of words flooring around. Is it conductive, is it inductive? So in the United States, we are osteoconductive. Um, we have a really nice study in a, a canine model where we put our bone graft into a soft tissue pouch. So in, in a soft tissue blunt dissection into a paraspinalis muscle and beagles, and at 12 weeks pulled out um, a, a, a piece of bone, which under um, microscopy looked like mature lamellar bone. So that study is not accepted in the US to get an osteoinductive claim, but in other parts of the world it has been accepted. So yeah. it depends upon the air that we breathe. And the North American air is not inductive, yes. it's conductive. Yep, Got in it. the US it's conductive. Okay, uh, Chris, why is bone morphogenic protein, I'm not using a product name here, not a good idea at this point in time to be used in oncologic cases. So um, <clears throat> there's a long history to uh, bone morphogenetic protein in uh, neoplasms, uh, you know, in, in metastatic uh, disease of the spine. Uh, interestingly, uh, if you uh, put BMP, uh, sorry, bone morphogenetic prote protein onto cell lines, 50% of the tumor cell lines are going to grow and 50% are going to arrest. Uh, and so there's been uh, eternal, uh, debate on that. And as a general rule, most uh, neurosurgeons, spine surgeons, ortho orthopedic surgeons uh, treating metastatic disease avoid bone morphogenetic protein with um, cancer history. Uh, and the reason for that is the unproven association of, of uh, recurrence of disease. Uh, so it's a, it's a little bit of a medical legal area. And so I never use PMP uh, in a case of metastatic disease, given that 50% of cancer cell lines could potentially see that as a metodic uh, stimulus and and sort of uh, you know like uh, proliferate and, and reoccur so i think it's it's out in 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 metastatic disease so i think they answered and one follow-up question immediately um a rhetorical question because i contributed some of the articles to that is bone morphogenic protein safe in terms of creating oncologic disease de novo or is there a ongoing oncologic concern a colleague who at the time was editor-in-chief of the Spine Journal um, uh, wrote an article that based on a re-review of the original 320 patients from the initial trial, that there was an increased incidence of oncologic disease. Uh, now looking back at this 10 years, 15 years later, is that a factor or not? So I think, in, in, so the, the data, at least the way I read it, uh, and I've reviewed, you also wrote a, a large meta-analysis a couple of years on this. Uh, so. Um, in healthy patients without cancer history, there's no clear connection between uh, BMP and, and de novo uh, neoplasms. Uh, again, in cancer, it's a different story, even though, uh, to my knowledge, has never been proven either. I don't think there's any convincing evidence that it would have that effect. Uh, but again, it's, un, you know, if you have, a, just as an example, you have a patient, you do a resection, a patient undergoes all the treatment, has a recurrent of disease at the site you use BMP, you're going to be on thin ice. So um, th uh, we just editorially speaking, we did perform a Washington state uh, population study with over 10,000 patients and we found no oncologic connection. I have no conflict of interest regarding the uh, company that produces this, but uh, we did receive a modest and I did not get any research fund to support the research itself. We did a five year follow up study and we found exactly the same oncologic lines. We did this with uh, members of the Department of um, uh, Oncology at the University of Washington, uh, Division, I should say, Oncology at the UW and large epidemiologic uh, participation from UW also. Yeah. So, And so those were healthy patients with all the neoplasm? We did a population study in so, Washington where the device was used okay. and we divided oncologic and non-oncologic patients. We saw exactly the same survival rates, exactly the same de novo diagnosis rates. Uh, so, I mean, this is a population study and uh, the curves are literally identical. So would you use it in a, in a metastatic disease? So again, these are not, this is basically the, the question here was, 
does uh, bone morphogenic protein create oncologic disease or not? That was the yeah. premise that was raised at the time. We cannot answer whether it's safe to be used, and I do not use it. Rod, what are your thoughts, uh, and what do you use when you do a far lateral surgery like you did here? What, what do you fill this cavity with, or is it irrelevant? Do you just rely on the mechanics for the remainder of the hopefully long survival time of the patient? I think fusion. We wrote a very nice review on that there really has been a lot of data with BMP um, and oncology. I think you did a really nice systematic review, but I just use Allograft and, um, you know, we're able to get it. I think FUT actually is very interesting, it doesn't go through the cage, but it goes lateral to it. So we have, we have lots of cases like this where, you know, within a year, um, you start to see bone formation laterally. So um, we've always used Allograft. So Dr. Sage, you're an expert in bone healing and you have to do some pretty difficult bone healing um, solutions in the foot and ankle area. What is your advice? What should we use? You're speaking here on behalf of a company, I know that, but uh, know. we have a I healing conversation. <laughs> no, but just speak from their heart. <laughs> No, I mean, and like I said earlier, I, I would, I myself would look for a bone graft that's osteoconductive and osteoinductive and doesn't have the potential that has growth factors in it that could perpetuate a cell line that I don't want perpetuated. Okay, so I'm getting a vague advice here. Dr. Hofstetter, yeah. um, this afternoon, what are you going to do at UW for a similar case? So I think, uh, you know, the really, uh, really exciting news for all of us here right now for cases like this is, you know, the tremendous strides that oncology has made for patients with metastatic disease. And so, uh, you know, that has actually been one of the most rewarding things in our careers. Uh, now you see patients that have tumors, uh, have local control, have systemic control, uh, <clears throat> and then have, you know, live for years to come. And so, uh, like Rod said before, I mean, I think, uh, you know, your observation was right on, right? I mean, what we need here now is to create that bony bridge, right? Uh, and that in an environment that is hostile, right? A patient with chemotherapy, a patient with local radiation. And so how do you create something that really fuses there? And so I think, I think this is going to be really important for all these patients that will become chronic long-term survivors with their disease. So I think this is a really, really amazing case for, for discussing that because I think it's becoming more and more of an issue. Why don't we go forwards, Jared? So um, we're presenting this as a complication, and that's, I take responsibility for that. Right. So he's uh, working with physical therapy a couple of days later. Um, you know, starts to get uh, intense low back pain, unable to mobilize because of it. A new CT scan is ordered, um, and uh, this is what it shows. So uh, I've got a, a fracture of, uh, of L2, um, so lower instrument, instrumented uh, vertebra, um, and you kind of just see structurally what that looks like uh, at this point. Now there's uh, also, um, you know, some displacement of the cage, the uh, that uh, uh, caudal uh, foot plate, um, you know, it is uh, actually like causing some uh, some stenosis. You don't see it on this cut, but it's uh, it looks like it could be problematic. So my planning was um, not uh, good. This is a somewhat predictable thing. I want to. Uh, credit Dr. Farah uh, Kash, um, who identified are there enough fixation levels. So the standard teaching is two above, two below, or more. And again, this is a, pace, a case in point. And my cement fill, uh, if I wanted to get away with just one below, was obviously not satisfactory. And the screw length probably could have been more uh, pronounced by cortical. Chris, how do we get out of this pickle now? Well, uh, again, I mean, I think, th thanks, Jens, for sharing this. This shows, you know, how, you know, that you know you're really sort of willing to discuss that and we all had these cases uh you know one thing that you know to make you not feel too bad about this you know looking at the uh coronal ct scan it almost looks like there's disease in l2 already you see that on the left side that seems to be a punched out lesion um so also compared to the preoperative uh, this is the x-ray that was just done a couple of weeks before i think this lesion is just rapidly <laughs> progressing here right now and even the imaging before surgery might already be you know it almost looks like there's disease in l2 um, and so I think uh, there's a couple things that need to be done here right now. Um, the cage needs to be repositioned uh, and the instrumentation in the back needs to be revised. Um, I probably would do the back first. Um, and again, now at this point, you have to go three below at least. Uh, I think you can rescue L2 uh, by just using a more anatomical trajectory. 
Um, and then on top of it, go three, two. At this point, there's no there's no more cubes here right now. You just go for the brute, um, you know, fixation, and then you go back in the lateral, reposition the cage, and 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 hope for the best. So Jared, take us forwards. Um, it's kind of echoes what we did. So we uh, looked back at L two. I could not find disease back there, but I uh, retrospectively had the same uh, suspicion and doubt. We did send off new tissue samples. So, uh, so with uh, you know the revision um, went down to uh, L four up to T ten uh, quad rod construct uh, with the accessory rod spanning, um, you know spanning the uh, corpectomy site. Uh, the plan uh, was to uh, do a corpectomy of uh, L two, take out the uh, the cage, um, that L one cage. When um, you know when we actually looked at it. it Obviously, it could only fit so many slices on a slide, um, but that cage was sunk into uh, it, it sunk into L two. Um, so, so, what you can sometimes do there is actually cement augment that in a posterior approach. Mm -hmm. Again, I think I would have tried to rescue L two yeah. just because you know a big guy, you know such a long construct. So I would have tried to somewhat cement in L two uh, and, and just even if you have a little bit of residual to do it, uh, it's a long construct. But I think the the quad rod is definitely going to be helpful. <laughs> So this is a very insightful thing. I had every plan and every hope to save L2. It was blown <laughs> to pieces. It was truly, uh, who was there with me? Were you with me, Jared? Uh, no, I, I was assisting Dr. Escuian on the lateral, yeah. but L, L2 didn't exist. And L2 yeah. uh, basically had truly just disintegrated. Well, like Mike Tyson says, right? The, the best plan falls apart once you get punched in the face. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That was, I felt punched in the face. I felt very bad and again, uh, in retrospect, the predictability of failure was um, evident, and I agree. agree. Uh, let's talk briefly about access morbidity. So this is Dr. Garrett uh, Lewitt here next to me. He's one of our research fellows. He's from Germany, and he's a Bayern Munich fan like me. Uh, so we could uh, share in the last second uh, triumphs and tribulations of that team. But he's done a cool project on anatomy. Uh, he's going to show this just in, I think, two weeks or so. Um, uh, we want to see what the actual access morbidity is when we go to a thoracolumbar junction vertebra. Uh, tell us briefly, without the images right now, what you did. Um, so yeah, thank you, Dr. Chapman. Um, it's actually a cadaver study, uh, including um, five cadavers. We um, try to go in with a, a far lateral approach on the left side, um, targeting for a T12 uh, copectomy and cage implantation. Uh, and our aim at the study was really to detect which structures are at risk with this approach. So what we do is um, we start um, in a lateral position, just doing the, the whole surgery, um, just finishing everything with the cage implantation. And then after we finished, we flip the patient around uh, and then the cadaver, the cadaver. Sorry, the cadaver. That's very important to mention. Sorry. Uh, and then we do a, a big anterior approach with a stenotomy. Um, and laparotomy, so uh, we can really have a good view um, of all the structures uh, who are involved um, and really have a good overview which uh, structures were at risk. And yeah, we just um, finished our um, yeah, interventional work uh, last week. Um, yeah, and just to give uh, some, some insights what we, what we detected. Um, so our target level was always T12. Um, so at the at the diaphragm, we were um, very happy that there weren't any injuries to the diaphragm so far. It was pretty pretty nice. Um, the parietal pleura um, was injured. Um, the the size of the injury um, was different between in one patient zero point five times two centimeters, um, leading up to um, three times four centimeters. So that's some variability. Yeah, the images were pretty dramatic in the parietal pleural mm -hmm. injury. So this is a invasion of the chest cavity. So chest tubes are an expected thing. It's not a complication. Uh, you try to lift up the, you know, so you go to uh, T12. That's a really, uh, it's a really nice uh, anatomical challenging region. So uh, what you can do is, uh, you know, the this ciliac cavity of the retro uh, peritoneal area and of the Plural, a retropleural area is actually continuous, um, and so mm -hmm. if you're very, very careful, you can lift up the diaphragm, uh, you know, then uh, detach the uh, lateral attachment of the medial arcuate ligament onto L1, and so then mm -hmm. goes right in the cruise of the diaphragm. Uh, if you get everything right, um, yeah. then it's a really nice approach, but uh, the issue is that the peritoneum pooches out a little bit in the back, and you can 
get it quite easily there. But it's a, it's a very elegant uh, surgery. If not you had no peritoneal thing. injuries, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, the peritoneal was always completely intact. And Tim and his team and uh, our fellows did a very nice job measuring the distance to all the various vessels and the um, lymphatics uh, and all that. So we'll get some cool pictures. And when are you going to present that? Um, yeah, shortly. We're just uh, collecting all two the, weeks, all the right? data and yeah, yeah, I think two to two to three weeks. Very cool right. pictures uh, mm -hmm. from the inside, what yeah. we usually don't see. Yeah, that's great. So thanks, Garrett. Rod, so this was hard. So you bailed me out of something. How hard is it to do a multi-level corpectomy? In your research, have you found any differences of neurovascular injuries when you do corpectomies as opposed to the usual discectomies and especially a two-level corpectomy? I know you published a paper on neurologic injuries with corpectomies versus discectomies. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... <clears throat> nerve injury is the most common uh, problem that we have, and then followed by, you know, Garrett's paper is, um, you know, uh, retroperitoneal, visceral, um, lung, you know, um, the junction is kind of one of these areas where, uh, you know, there's lots of structures there, so you just, you know, you have to be cognizant of the area that you're in, and retroperitoneal approaches to this area are kind of nice because um, you know you don't have to do a huge shark bite incision and and so I think um, uh, both Jared and Abe were there you know even though it was a revision we were able to go back in take the cage out put a new cage in it's a little difficult getting a little bit inferior but in the end you can see the nice size implant that we were able to replace. This patient had absolutely no lumbar plexus problems. One of our previous fellows, uh, Dr. Godolphus, did a beautiful 3D uh, printout of the lumbar plexus from a conventional MRI. I think I showed that in Prague with Dr. Hofstede in a session. It's done from a conventional MRI scan, and it's absolutely scary to see that lumbar plexus. Uh, Rod, any retractor things or tips and tricks to try to minimize lumbar plexus damage? I mean, you were co-author on a paper of uh, Perry. Pretty scary stuff there, all that yellow. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of pushing the limit. I mean, we had a hard time getting, um, so after two levels, the cage um, is actually larger than the, than the, um, the retractor. So it's hard to do. I've done actually three level, but you end up having to um, do some manipulating of the cage uh, and the retractor because the cage ends up being too big. But now all these companies have great expandables, so it's getting better and better every year. Let's talk about radiation. So Dr. John Chen asked uh, SBRT postoperatively, uh, Chris, how long should we wait before we start that? And there are multiple companies who now have radiolucent uh, products out there. Um, is that meritorious? I mean, we have a lot of titanium in here. Why is that a problem? So how long? Uh, until we radiate, and why do we wait? And number two, uh, is there too much metal here? Is there too much scatter? Should we use carbon fiber or whatever? So, uh, uh, in terms of uh, waiting for radiation, uh, the reason for waiting for radiation is so that the wounds heal, okay? Uh, typically, it's three weeks. Uh, by that time, you can start to radiate. Um, and uh, the typically to uh, IMRT, um, if uh, that type of radiation, um, there is scatter around, uh, you know, uh, titanium grafts, uh, where um, titanium grafts really make a big difference is proton beam, which would not be used in this case, uh, most likely. And so for traditional IMRT image guided uh, radiation, uh, titanium is slightly of a disadvantage because there's some inhomogeneities of the uh, radiation field. How much that is is still under debate, uh, and we're actually having some studies going on for that. Um, for primary tumors and tumors that need uh, proton radiation, uh, those really benefit from carbon fiber uh, instrumentation. Point blank question. So mechanical stability, originally surgeon decision making, of course, the surgeon being myself. Uh, is a big factor in this guy. Is the carbon fiber strong enough to hold a 260 pound guy um, with two little rods? And we did a quad rod construct here, as you can see, uh, with compound fixation. So tell us about the mechanical fixation strength of rods and the extreme mechanical challenges and over time, moreover. 
Yeah, no, I think again, since there's no clear advantage from an oncological perspective in this patient because it's not a, it's most likely not a primary tumor. Again, we don't, we still have not, have you heard it? It's a hepatic tumor. So, so it's not a differentiated hepatocellular. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a primary tumor. So I think there would no be, not be any, any clear advantage to using uh, carbon fiber instrumentations. Also, you don't have that, um, you know, you have cross connectors, you have quad rods, side connectors. All that technology is uh, a little bit more in its infancy for that. Also, you can bend the that uh, the carbon fiber rods. Um, there is pretty good carbon fiber expandable cages now for corvectomies. Um, so I think it's a technology that is going to come uh, slowly, uh, but I think uh, we're not there yet. Yeah, we did not have a long enough cage. Uh, we talked about carbon fiber cages from the front that can be uh, put in through tubular methods, at least not in our institution. We heavily thought about that. Um, great. Learning points for yourself, Jared. You're involved in the salvage. Thank you for salvaging my patient. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think learning points, uh, one, um, just a, a longer construct from, uh, you know, from the get go, um, you know, considering, uh, you know, considering patient size, um, and, you know, potentially bone quality, um, you know, maybe I'd, do a you know quad rod from uh, you know from the beginning um, you know knowing that we're you know we're planning on doing that lateral corpectomy um, so I think those are those are kind of going to be the big the big ones for this I mean hindsight's twenty twenty but um, great after that second surgery the patient actually did from our spine he's doing point, great remarkably well I mean it was truly again Dr Dikotowski talked about mechanical stability but the question mark in the chat. I actually have to say this is like a poster uh, patient for mechanical stability. He literally jumped out of bed with a little encouragement after the second stage surgery, the unwanted one. Learning points uh, for us, Chris? Always be modest. Uh, I always expect the worst uh, and hope for the best. So we have 15 minutes. Uh, we'll go through another case. Uh, Dr. Mauricio Avila is going to come here. And Mauricio uh, came to us from the University of uh, Arizona, neurosurgery. Thank you, Jared, by the way. We have 15 minutes, Mauricio, to talk about another complication of mine, and this time in a different arena of physiologically challenged patients, which we're seeing more and more. Mauricio is going to be an academic faculty at um, St. Louis University, and we're excited about his future career path. Great to have you here, and great to have our University of Arizona connection. Thank you. Um... So yeah, this is another case, a uh, 34-year-old male who uh, this uh, second time presents to the ER with neck pain and bilateral arm weakness. He also was reporting some uh, posterior neck pain and left shoulder pain. He said for about two, three weeks, and he has noticed progressive weakness um, getting worse in the past week before presentation, but probably going on per his report for about two weeks. He wasn't able to use his hands. He was on standing his feet, um, but he denied any bowel bladder issues. Has a relevant medical history. He unfortunately uh, abuses drug. He does IV meth. He's a tobacco user. Has HIV, syphilis, hepatitis C, and history of cardiac vegetations. And as Dr. Uh, Chapman was already pointing out, his relevant past surgical history. He had an ACDF six months prior to his last presentations, due to uh, uh, spinal osteomyelitis. Uh, back then, the uh, the bacteria was uh, MRSA. Uh, unfortunately, he only completed. IV antibiotics in the hospital, but he did not have any follow up with their uh, ID or our clinic until he presented again to the to the ER. Uh, this is exam. Uh, you'll see the image uh, in a minute. Despite the image, he only had about four four plus uh, weakness in his upper extremities. His relevant labs, his web blood count was not that elevated. However, his ESR and CRP are elevated. So I think everybody knows what where this is going. This is just for reference. This was the kind of original um, images for his surgery six months prior to the last presentation. So on the left-hand side, you see MRI with contrast and the epidural and um, abscess there and the post-op for uh, the one level ACDF done there. Um, just relevant, uh, the, you can see the allograft. Dr. Sage, I have a question for you. You're not a spine surgeon. In our arena, usually, there's the simplest bone healing model that everybody loves because it has relatively low failure rates, so it is reported. Those are anterior cervical fusions. Why do we still accept anterior cervical fusions as a model when the actual number of patients that we need to demonstrate a delta, meaning a difference, would have to be in the probably thousands, at least in the several hundreds? So 
why do we use a best possible area rather than a most challenging area to demonstrate bone healing? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. And that's something that's come up um, in the sort of industry world. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Is this thing on? Um, testing. Yeah. So uh, now I lost my train of thought. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's a really interesting point because this is something that's coming up um, in terms of being on the industry side of things, looking at regulatory and trying to like tell regulatory bodies that if you have your worst case scenario, then that should waterfall down to some of the best case scenarios and not the other way around. So this is a conversation that we're like currently having in terms of looking at like, you know, lumbar um, posterior lateral fusions, for example, being kind of like one of a more challenging case. And if you confuse in that model, then maybe that means something for fusing in some other models. Um, but I think you're right. We should, we should look at the, the hardest, worst case scenarios as sort of our, our, our testing block and then move it from there and not start with the easiest. So there's a protein called P50. I don't want to mention the uh, manufacturer. Is that an osteoconductive or an inductive product? It's, it's labeled as osteoconductive. Mm -hmm. And allograft, uh, is that preferably frozen or is that uh, okay to use a freeze dried product? And why is there a difference? So, allograft, once again, osteoconductive. When you start to move into the osteoinductives, those are like DBMs, which are kind of weakly osteoinductive. Um, like the cell based are a little bit more osteoinductive. And then, you know, the, the name we keep mentioning without naming um, is, is really the one that's known to be um, solidly osteoinductive. Um, the, the cell base are also osteogenic, um, which, you know, there's, there's some literature showing that that, you know, having cells may or may not be helpful in, in a bone graft. Is it uh, worth the price difference to pay for a frozen allograft or is a freeze-dried allograft with a three-year durability that's just in a storage place okay? I think it depends on what you're going for. If you just, well, so right, so if you just need a filler and you want to fill up an empty space and you have a lot of confidence that this patient is, is going to heal, um, then that's very different than if you're looking for something where you need a, a far more robust. I mean, the challenge with something like this is, is you don't want to put something in that's just going to become necrotic and infected and be another nitus. So your foot and ankle surgeon, if you have a failed total ankle and you got to take it out and fuse the patient, what are you going to fill that gap with? Um, an, an a, 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 yeah, frozen a frozen allograft, yeah. a, a freeze dried allograft. Yeah, I'm going to take a femoral head and, and cut it down to the size okay. that I need. Frozen. Yeah, but but after a significant period of time of you know like IV antibiotics, I'd probably put a spacer in. And Chris, thank you. It's a good answer, Chris. This is going to be a failure. I did this. What do you think about this? You see, a, uh, I mean, I think we share the majority of the burden of this uh, city with its uh, very large uh, impaired populations. Yeah. Um, did I do okay here? What did I do wrong? What would you do different? This is going to fail. Yeah, no, I think it's obviously you, you predicated that already. So uh, I think a couple of things oh. about this case, uh, you know, you know, it's, you know, we don't talk about stories here as much as we do in a lumbar spine, you know, where you have the maximum stenosis to get the disc. Um, you know, given that there's a phlegma there, a ventral, I probably, again, would have failed equally, but I probably would have come from the back for this case, um, because even though you got a really nice decompression there, um, you, you know, it's, you know, I'm sure you used like if, you know, 90 degree correct to reach over. So I think that's one, I probably would have done this from the back, would have failed equally. Uh, then he would have cut host over. <laughs> um, I don't think technically everything is done really nicely. You did bicortical screws. Um, you did a nice graph that you, you distracted it nicely and restored the height there. Um, I think technically not that much you could have done differently. In the early 2000s with Jim Schuster, we actually published on structural allografts, uh, mainly thoracal lumbar spine, I believe. Um, and uh, the largest population segment were at the time intravenous drug users, and uh, they had an actually very nice healing rate. So yeah. uh, we put that in the literature. I think it was published in Spine, and Jim Schuster was not at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. Deserves a lot of credit for having hunted down those patients. The reinfections that we had in the majority were different organisms than what they were in the primary thing. He actually did an incredible amount of work sleuthing those patients out using community health resources to track them down. So we, we from that, uh, were able to establish that the majority of reinfections come from different vectors rather than the initial organism uh, causing a reinfection. Uh, Mauricio, what would you have done in Arizona? You have a number of uh, similarly impaired patients there. I, I'd probably the same. Just the, the way we try to uh, make it simple, it's ventral, the axis is from anterior. Um, you can see, let me just point it out too, there's some 
some thickening of the prevertebral uh, fascia there as well. So you can drain this out and then from anterior to the disc and, and drain this. So probably we'll have done the same. And allograft as a substitute? Um, we or the dreaded plastic. And uh, we also use uh, titanium implants. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing with this patient, as, as you know, like case in point, if they don't follow up, it's hard to know what happens. Or they may be in a different hospital now, a different city. So, uh, but yeah, we use both. And the ones that follow, if they finish the antibiotics and, you know, kind of turn the lap around, they, they tend to heal. I think that inflammatory process helps. Now, everybody wants to know what failed, so show us what happened next. So, yeah, so this is, um, now he's a new presentation. So um, I just put the contrast one on the left and the T2 there. How Do far you, out are we? So it's five, six months. Again, he only completed, uh, I think, uh, roughly two weeks, which is the amount of, he was in the hospital uh, for his IV antibiotics. Uh, so you can see now the infection is spreading on the uh, both virtual bodies above and below. Uh, also, again, a, a ventral uh, epidural uh, phlegmon abscess, and you can see the stenosis. And I don't know if it projects, but some some uh, changes in the in the cord signal on the T2. I'll show you the CAT scan. So this is how that allograft uh, looks now, six months after, almost. Um, the screws at C6 appear like they're floating now into the the void. Uh, same with the C4, uh, C5, sorry, and the C4 virtual body is starting to be eaten out by the infection. So that's the new presentation. So now, I guess, in terms of discussion, so what do we do? Antibiotics, collar, don't do anything. Anterior revision, what type of graph, dial graph, autograph, titanium peak. Posterior only, or a combined anterior and posterior. Chris, you want to go posteriorly first. So first of all, surgery is clear, right? Cervical epidural abscess. We wrote two papers at Harvard that I think helped shape the literature that's now become pretty established. Yep. As a board examiner uh, for neurosurgery, you'd say cervical epidural abscess, somewhere to pharyngeal abscess, surgery. So correct? anytime you have an um, epidural abscess or phlegma in the epidural space, uh, uh, surgery is indicated or should be considered anytime with an epidural abscess plus neurological deficit it needs to be performed so that's kind of the you know there's a very simple rules that we have here uh, you have uh, you know symptomatic stenosis high high level high grade stenosis uh, and you're failing instrumentation in front so i think you have to take care of both uh, so i probably would do a, a you know a, you know posterior instrumentation and decompression uh, again decompression very very uh, you want to be very careful in the back because it's the only bone you have left. So you definitely have to decompress, but you want to make sure you keep as much of the bone as you can. Um, the front, you have to um, at least take the instrumentation out because it's floating. It's also floating into the canal a little bit. The screws, are, they're kind of getting back there. So uh, there's not going to be any material to work with though in the front. So, um, so, so that's almost like a, a mm -hmm. four level. I mean, like you need, we need to do a, I mean, there's like how many levels are involved? This seems to be like three levels plus. Yeah, three. Levels. Okay, Marithi, we have three minutes. Okay. Take us forward. So um, we did a uh, uh, back front. So first uh, we went from the back, uh, cervical laminectomies and a C2 to T2 fusion. And then from the front, uh, revised it. And I don't know if it projects, you can see there's a fibular strut here. I think the biggest discussion was what type of Graft, should we use? Should we use peak? Should we use titanium? Should we use an expandable cages? Should we just uh, fibular allograft? Um, and those are the intraop images. So uh, we're waiting for the follow up. That's, uh, that's uh, three dots of, of this case. We're waiting for the follow up. Um, the patient um, was wanting to uh, turn his life around. The addiction team here at Swedish was consulted and they helped him to try to find uh, shelter and, and hopefully he'll follow up and then we can see the at least short-term, medium-term results of, of the construct. Neurological exam was better after surgery. All right, so I'll go back to that. So, um, Chris, how are we doing now? Hardware in an infection. Good idea, bad idea. There's a plate in the front where there was a pus um, raging just a couple of moments ago. 
Um, I mean, most of the literature that I'm aware of, uh, you know, is okay with um, allograft, as with allografts, with titanium uh, in, a, in an infected cavity. So um, I think we're good. The issue is going to be the follow-up and the and the IV treatment, IV antibiotics treatment with this patient. Self-advertising. One of our fellows, Dr. Jonathan Plumer, published a very exhaustive systematic review, including a meta-analysis of hardware in orthopedic infections in spine and found not only that it is safe, but actually effective. Patients had better pain outcomes and longer survival times than patients who were treated without hardware and infections. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know, I think stabilization, you need stabilization in order to make it heal. Yeah. So I think there's no debate. I mean, that's fantastic. It's Instability and deformity, but it's never been done because our ID doctors still torture us when we have hardware and infected uh, spine. They tell us we need lifelong antibiotics and all that, which by the way is not supported in the literature. Yeah. So we, we have a, uh, uh, a hopefully very well quoted paper that will support our use of hardware to avoid instability, deformity, and progressive neurologic deficits. Yeah. Learning points for yourself, Mauricio, go post here like Dr. Hofstetter had uh, said. I, I, I think looking back, and that's why I wanted to show the six months prior, I, I will have gone from the front just because the, the abscess is right there and it's just like it's, it's from the front. I can go from the front. I think there's, there's, there's so much that we can do as surgeons and as physicians if the patient doesn't want to follow up and we do our best. I mean, and the patients keep using drugs and not yeah. following their recommendations. So uh, by going from the front, this is where I disagree with Dr. Hoff said I followed Sutton's law. You know Sutton's law, right? Yeah. Willie Sutton, the bank robber, did they teach you that? Uh, maybe you haven't mentioned it. Is this Willie one of those like was... Murphy's law adjacent? No. <laughs> Things that are going to go wrong. Willie wrong. Sutton's <laughs> law, he was a bank robber in the 20s and he was very successful and they asked him, what's your secret to success? And he said, I go where the money's at. <laughs> there you oh. go. <laughs> so that was Sutton's law. So yeah. Sutton's law for opportunity. All right. Great job. Thank you to our fellows and thank you for doing this. We had only two cases today, but we had some more time to discuss healing impaired patients. And please tune in to our special session. Angela, what's the date for that? The, the date for our fellows presentations? July 21st, we have an all-star accumulation of our fellows uh, presenting their research work with really cool cutting edge stuff. So please tune in. Thank you all for watching. We have a great international community. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Sage to you. It's an honor to have a foot and ankle surgeon here all the way from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, Dr. Sage is a bachelor, uh, get a bachelor's degree in Boston University, medical degree at Lincoln Memorial uh, in uh, osteopathic medicine. And she did her orthopedic surgery residency at Metro Health University of Michigan in Wyoming, Michigan, and a fellowship in foot and ankle surgery at the MedStar Union Memorial Hospital in Baltimore. And she is a scientific advisor for Kouros, but she continues to practice foot and ankle surgery. And yes, we share the problem of bone healing and foot and ankle surgery with spine surgery. It's uh, pretty hard sometimes. What am I doing wrong, Angela? I'm either over time or talking too much, or I unplugged something again, which I do pretty plainly. Dr. Tate, please join us up uh, front. And Dr. Hofstede, thank you for coming across. Thank you so much for having me. I noticed that on your posters here, you guys have kind of cut off the foot and ankle, except for like a little AP of the ankle. So, you know, next time you redesign it, feel free to consult me. I'm happy to help show you what the ankle looks like in the foot. Um, just kidding, obviously. But in all honesty, thanks so much for having me today. Um, that was a great introduction. So, um, like, like we said, I'm an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon, and I'm now the vice president of um, medical and scientific affairs for Curious Biosciences. So, um, Dr. Hofstetter and I are sharing a power point here, so I'm going to go ahead and get started um, with it and share both of our disclosures for, for each of us. So if you have questions about these, feel free to contact us afterwards. Um, but I'm here to talk to you about Curos. So Magnetos is the bone graft that we have on the market right now. It's kind of our flagship product. So um, Curos Biosciences is a international company founded in Europe um, and then moved to the States and then in Australia in 2021. And it's a purely biologics company. Um, we were founded by a PhD who's been making bone grafts since um, the 1980s. And along the way, he has discovered many new bone grafts, which he sold to all of um, the major spine companies that you've heard, out, uh, heard of uh, over the past you know, several years. So um, Nuvasiv, Depew, C-Spine, and so on. And so since we have a PhD at the helm, we're a very scientifically and research and evidence-based company. So there's about 70, 70 of us internationally, and I think out of the 70, 12 of us are either orthopedic surgeons or PhD. So we're very, very science committed, and I guess I can take the opportunity now to tell you that everything I'm going to show you today has been published 
published in a peer-reviewed journal. So we're not a company that has a bunch of data on file. So anything I show you, you can find. Um, we can hand it to you. You can find that on our website, which is curiosbio.com, or um, yeah, you can you can Google me and I'll send it to you um, if you can find me after you find my high school track meet pictures. <laughs> so um, that's about Kiros. Um, the way that we work is through macrophages. And so taking you back to medical school, macrophages are the first responders of the immune system. They come from a monocyte cell line and they can polarize according to the microenvironment. An M1 macrophage is a pro-inflammatory macrophage. It's really important. It starts to signal from mesenchymal stem cells to come to a site of tissue trauma or injury. But ultimately, they promote inflammatory fibroblasts and can push um, towards a scar tissue pathway. An M2 macrophage is a pro-healing macrophage and can upregulate um, cells such as stem cells. So a lot of this literature was done at Mayo um, over the past several years, and it's all published. What we did at Curos was we made a vital discovery, which is that a surface topography and a bone graph can modulate an M2 polarization. And if you look at bone graphs up close, these are all real images from a scanning electron microscope, you can see that surface topography of bone graphs has changed. And this shouldn't be new information. This is happening in hardware as well, right? We, there's tons of studies out about um, rough and titanium or, or other um, surface topography that can, uh, that can make a difference in bony and growth. And so if you look back at, at Kronos in 1982, you can see this is flat. This is granular. There's no porosity, really. It's before a lot of the studies on macro micro porosity came out. But as time goes by, you can see that the surface features change, and ultimately we end up with magnetos here on the right. And so we're submicron in size, and the surface topography is needle shaped. This is a real picture from a high resolution scanning electron microscope. And this is what we say about magnetos is it's this needle grip surface topography. And I'll read you these bullet points and then I'll take you through the science that backs up everything we say here. So magnetos can grow bone even in soft tissue through harnessing M2 macrophages, which are involved in a, a bony healing pathway. This unlocks previously untapped potential to stimulate stem cells and grow bone throughout the graft. And this field of science is called osteoimmunology, which is really the relationship between how an immune system uh, can affect a skeletal healing system. Um, I think we're kind of aware of that in terms of medications that blunt the immune system and how that can sort of stop our bony healing or fusion, things like steroids, high-dose onsets for a long period of time, et cetera. Okay, so it's a three-path path pathway. Um, polarize, regenerate, and propagate. So polarize, um, I already kind of mentioned. We know that the submicron needle-shaped surface topography can polarize M2 macrophages. Two is regenerate. So we know how M2 macrophages are involved in a bony healing pathway. We know specifically that M2 macrophages secrete osteoactivin and BMP2. We know that they can induce mesenchymal stem cells to proliferate and differentiate into osteoblasts. And again, that's not our research. This is just in the body of literature. We know what M2 macrophages do and how they can promote bone growth. And three is propagate. So we propagate bone in the core region, not just from creeping edge repair. And I'll show you all of our literature next. So this is what we did in the very beginning. We had bone grafts with different surface topography, and we wanted to prove that M2 macrophages were a mechanism of action. So this is a bench top study. You can see the magnetos surface in the background here. Ooh, this thing's a little touchy, huh? And then this is a conventional bone graft. And um, so a conventional surface topography in the background. So what we did was we took, um, donor blood from human patients. We didn't just buy, buy cell lines. We spun it down to the Buffy coat. We put it on different surface topographies to see what happened. And what we were looking for was um, the M1 versus M2 polarization. So these are M2 macrophages right here. And this is an M1. Gosh. I hate to in, uh, in, inject, uh, interject here. What's a Buffy coat? I'm just a little bit yeah. slow on the uptake here. You're very fast with your words. Stay close to the microphone. I need to I listen to it and absorb what a Buffy yes. coat is. So you take human blood, you spin it down, right? And you have your plasma layer, and then you have that nice thick red blood layer that has all of the cells that are in your free flowing blood. Okay, thank you. Now yep. I know what a Buffy coat is. I'll talk, I'll with, talk slower. Nothing to do with a vampire slayer. No, <laughs> not yet. We should, we could, we could work on that though. It would, it would be a drink for a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So we did this, we saw that we had M2 macrophages, but I'm gonna try and actively slow down now because you're right, I do talk a little fast. Um, so we saw that we had M2 macrophages, but we didn't just wanna rely on what we were looking at under a microscope. 
We know what proteins M1 macrophages and M2 macrophages produce at any given time, time point. So the next thing we did was ELISA testing. And we we're looking specifically for M2 macrophage markers. So CCL18 and CD163. And once again, this was just kind of validating what we were seeing on our um, microscopy. So we did sort of confirm that those were M2 macrophages we were looking at. The next thing we did was still bench top. So we took the protein soup from that, those first slides where we saw that the M2 macrophages were secreting proteins. We took that protein soup and we put it back on our surface topography, which you can see here. And we looked for the next thing that happened. So we, we know that human mesenchymal cells can be stimulated by M2 macrophages to differentiate into pre-osteoblasts and start to spread out and fuse together. And that's what we're seeing here. All right, so these are what happens next. Once again, we didn't just look at what we were seeing on a microscope, we wanted to validate it with ELISA testing. So in this case, we looked at ALP, so alkaline phosphatase marker of bone growth, bone turnover. And once again, we saw that our ALP was elevated on, on our needle grip magnetos surface um, versus the conventional bone graft. So those are our kind of bench top studies. The next thing we did was take it to a, a large animal model. So a, a, a lot of places will go to this like rat, mouse, rabbit study, we went straight to dogs. And I mentioned this study earlier. So this is a canine model. And we were looking at putting a bone graft in a soft tissue pouch, not on a fusion bed, um, not on decorticated bone. And we wanted to see what happens because we wanted to see if the M2 macrophages would differentiate. So soft tissue blood dissection into a pair of spinalis muscle and beagles, popped in bone grafts and waited for 12 weeks. And so we did this with a lot of different bone grafts. When we pulled out the magnetos at 12 weeks, this is what we found. So we put in a bone graft and then pulled out this at 12 weeks. And this was really a mic drop moment for the company because what, what we are seeing is anything, this fuchsia color is bone. Um, the black is the bone graft itself, nearly resorbed. Um, and when you look at this at a higher powered microscope, we can see what looks like really mature lamellar bone. So it's osteoblast, it's osteoclast, it's osteocyte sitting in the kunai. Um, we did this with a lot of different bone grafts just to try and replicate and see what happened in this canine model. Some of them did form some bone at some time point. Some of them, as you can imagine, um, we put in a bone graft and we pulled up bone at 12 weeks. Some of them had become somewhat fibrous. Um, some of them had resorbed. But once again, this is a paper that we can show you and you can look at the results of all these different bone grafts. But for us, this was really a, a life-changing moment because we put in a bone graft and we pulled up bone. We then took it to a clinically relevant validated sheet model looking at instrumented posterior lateral fusions. And what we did first was compare it to autograft, so gold standard autograft. Um, so these are sheep, so that's why the transverse processes are horizontal here. And what we did was um, put autograft on the top and then magnetos on the bottom. The black dots itself in between the TPs here is the magnetos itself. We know that the pink is bone. So what we showed is that if you look closely inside that blue circle, you can see that there's little pink fuchsia dots growing on the bone graft in the very center of the fusion bridge. So we know that we're not just relying on this like creeping edge repair, this osteoconductive scaffold. We actually see, um, you know, pink bone growing in the very center here. So we know that our mechanism of action is working, right? Wherever the bone graft is, we have the surface topography, M2 macrophages are polarizing, bone is starting to grow. Um, ultimately, um, the authors of this paper concluded that, com that uh, Magnetos uh, equ made a complete bridging bone equivalent to autograft. Um, one concern with bone grafts that we all worry about is with our human patients, we can't, we can't get histology slides like that. So what we're relying on is our radiographic imaging. And we've all had cases where we put in bone graft, things look you know, good or great on our x-rays or our CTs, but, but you don't know if you're looking at bone, you don't know if you're looking at bone graft, you don't look, you know if you're looking at fibrous tissue. And so we wanted to just kind of like do an animal model to, to think about that. So in this one, once again, um, it's, a, it's a sheet model, instrumented PLF, and we compared magnetos to nova bone and VTOS and autograft. And so these are what the CTs looked like at, tw at 12 weeks. And you can see, you know, there's definitely something happening. We see this kind of Swiss cheese effect of autograft where we know it starts to resorb. 
But ultimately, we sacrifice the sheep, and this is what we came up with. So the top two slides are really similar to what you've seen before at 12 weeks. We have this nice solid bony fusion all the way across for autograft and magnetos. Um, the nova bone, I always like to point this out because these are actual glass particles and smile glass. Over here, like kind of a nice example of creeping edge repair. This is VTOS itself up here, and this is fibrous tissue coming across. So once again, published, happy to show you this paper and talk through it with you. Moving on from animals, we have our human clinical trial. So I'm just gonna sort of talk about this and you can um, you know, ignore that slide because it's got a lot, of, uh, a lot of words on it. But basically what we did is a prospective randomized control trial with an intrapatient control. So this is instrumented posterior lateral fusions. And what we did was we put magnetos granules on one side and autograft on the other side. The autograft was at least 50% iliac crest bone. So the surgeons agreed to take bone from iliac crest. We volume controlled, so it was 10 cc per side per level. And we tried to blind as much as we could. So the surgeons had to prep the corticate, get everything ready before they were told what bone graft was gonna go on what side. Uh, our follow-up was one year fine cut CT scans read by two blinded independent spine surgeons. Dr. Hoster was teasing me yesterday, they were blind, but just blinded. Um, and they had to look at coronal, sagittal, and axial views. Um, so really nice study. All 100 patients have had their surgery, and this is a report on the first 50 that have had their CTs. And I'll note here that once this study is completed, this is a prospective randomized intrapatient controlled trial. This will be level one data. This will be published in a in a high-level peer-reviewed journal. And this is where we ended up. So if you look on the right, by subject, we had a 78% fusion rate for the magnetus granules. If you look at the literature, this is very high for a granule used standalone. This is not mixed with autograft, it's not mixed with BMA, it's not mixed with anything else. If you look at other bone grafts in this category, their fusion rates are near about this percentage when it's mixed with, with other things. Um, there is a, a carbon copy study of this that's published, which I can share with you, where their fusion rate is 55% um, versus our 78%. So we will be finished collecting CTs this fall, and we'll be writing up this data and publishing it. But overall, we are very, very pleased with this number. This is really high for a standalone granule. Um, we did lots of statistics. There's some concern about an intrapatient control in terms of if, if one side is solid and stable and fused, is that holding it steady for the other side to fuse? So lots of stats that we ran. This is all available to you. But we found um, that binomial modeling expected that the odds of fusion in the magnetos granules group was 2.54 times higher than the autograft group. Just a couple case reports here from this study. Um, I think I only have two here, but, but really what's more interesting are Dr. Hofstetter's cases and how he's actually using it and what he thinks of it. So um, if you wanna see cases, I have I think six of them from that, that white paper that's published and then ultimately the, I think that, that actual level one data will be published like Q124. So we'll have it for you then. Good job, Mel, we'll call you back up again. Thank you. Let's have Dr. Hofstetter come up yeah. and tell us about his clinical experience. He's again a, a truly world famous innovator in uh, MIS surgery, minimally invasive surgery, and obviously the lack of access sometimes makes bone healing particularly challenging. So let's see what your insights are in terms of optimizing bone healing. Well, first of all, thanks so much for inviting me, Jens, and Rod. Uh, he's probably eating his birthday cake right now. Um, and. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we've been using magnetos uh, for the last six months. Um, the reason for doing so was to find an alternative to uh, allograft. Um, as we all know, uh, the last several years have been challenging for uh, sourcing uh, allograft at the pandemic. Um, it has been uh, a product that has had the challenges and I think we really ran against the wall. Um, and uh, like the cases that we share, uh, Jens and, and, and we, we're taking care of the sickest patient in town and we need tools. Um, and um, so far it looks really, really promising. So a couple of examples here right now. So uh, 86 year old male, uh, he had a type two dense fracture, is actually a dear colleague of mine. Um, and uh, as you can see there, he had a non-union despite uh, several months of, uh, he had three months of collar, um, and so he did not heal uh, spontaneously. And so he required a, a C1, C2 fusion. Um, and we got a CT scan after three months, and uh, I just want to, uh, you know, have you pay attention to uh, that area of the, like, that's a big circle, um, you know, of the joint down here that is totally filled in, and you can really see, uh, early bridging there. And again, it's three months, 
Um, but this is something that we see more and more. I just have a, uh, I saw a patient yesterday with a four month, uh, four month out uh, ACDF uh, two level, um, and there seems to be uh, much more integration than we would see with DBX. So I used to, uh, for these, I used to use Allograft. DBX and a small BMP, and now I just uh, use uh, Magnetos. Um, again, we are putting it to the test. Uh, you know, you saw my uh, disclosures, uh, but the, the truth is going to be in the CT scan. Uh, and so far, this looks very promising. So uh, patients doing well, I see them every, every week. Um, and I think uh, we'll get a CT scan uh, a year out, and then we'll, we'll see, but this looks very promising. Another case here right now that, uh, you know, a young uh, female, 25 year old, um, she had a, a car accident, and as you can see, there uh, uh, a super amplitude fracture of of L3, um, and so um, there was also some retropulsion. A neurological issue was intact, um, and so what we uh, did in her is uh, we did ligamental taxis. Um Again, uh, as we discussed before, uh, you can see the anatomical uh, location and, and sort of positioning of the L3 screw, uh, because I definitely wanted to rescue uh, that, given how young she was, I wanted to make sure that we lose as few motion segments as possible. Um, and so this was done percutaneously uh, with, a, with a reduction module. And I want to have you pay attention to this area. So what we do there is we percutaneously accentuate the joints, the facet joints, and then pack them with uh, uh, magnetos. Uh, and there is a couple properties why this is, uh, you know, really works well. First of all, these funnels that you use to fill the facet joints are pretty narrow. And so having autograft and allograft, often the particles have different sizes and you get stuck. I mean, I know it's a very practical surgeon problem, but, but the nice thing about magnetos is the particles are 250 micrometers and all standardized. Um, and actually anything that doesn't have the right size, they throw away. It's isoidric melanized. So they only, it's, it's only a, a very certain, um, you know, size. And what this does for a surgeon for you that you can use a small funnel once you've accentuated the joints and it can fill the joints for posterior lateral onlay fusion. Um, and I think that makes a, a small but distinct practical distance. That's also one thing that, um, you know, sometimes, you know, when we as surgeons do spine surgery, it's kind of a little bit like playing with Play-Doh. You have to kind of form that bone and bring it somewhere. And so handling characteristics and, and, and putting stuff together that just doesn't, you know, immediately fall off makes a big difference. And that's also something that they got really very, very nice. Uh, it, it has this sort of wax-like consistency that you can mix that. And again, as you can see, you can pack it nicely and you'll see the next case too, how this works. So uh, really is a very nice combination with my, you know, strides in, in minimal invasive and endoscopic stuff. All right, so now obviously uh, one, you know, trick pony, so we have to have some uh, endoscopic cases here right now. 63-year-old uh, morbidly obese female, postmenopausal history of uh, psoriatic arthritis, fibromyalgia, IBS. Everybody's like, red flag, red flag, red flag. Why do you operate on this? Well, you know, she had developed uh, perineal numbness and urinary incontinence. So uh, uh, early on, uh, caudic minor syndrome. Um, on exam, she was still intact, but very concerning symptoms uh, regarding a early slash uh, mild chronic caudic minor syndrome. So for this patient, your hands are tied. Uh, you have to think about decompressing. Uh, imaging confirmed that she had severe spinal stenosis at L4 or 5. And yes, this is indeed an, a T2 weighted image. So you can't see the fecal sac at all. Uh, so high grade stenosis, morbid obese patient. Uh, Jens and I, I think, I think we're taking care of the, the most interesting cases in town. Very all the juicy pathologies going here. So anyhow, so difficult case. Um, this is where I think the, uh, our expertise in MIS surgery and endoscopic surgery comes in nicely. Ventral, we talked about that, right? Ventral pathologies so become in ventral. So here, this little port goes in ventrally, uh, and the endoscope goes in for the decompression. Here's the tulips of the perk screws, navigation uh, 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 the, the, for navigating, so the the, the reference, um, and what we did there is uh, we placed an expandable cage, but then also as a posterior posterior lateral onlay fusion, we then accentuated the contra, I typically accentuated the contralateral joint, and then pack it uh, with bone, um, and so I think that. MIS endoscopic onlay fusion is going to really be helpful with, with these patients. 
And I think I had a video on this, but I think it somehow disappeared uh, in the video. Uh, it's, I think it's next after. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, again, one thing, uh, Jens and I were just in Prague and we had like hundreds of talks each. Uh, and a lot of the talks were also about um, MIS and tea lifts. Um, this is an endoscopic um, tea lift here right now. And, and really what we are uh, striving to is that reduction of low doses, you know, those eight, 10 degrees of low doses that you wanna get. Um, and, uh, and you can see that we can now start to accomplish that. Uh, also, we have um, a, a national uh, prospective registry of all these patients that we use a, a, an app for that we designed at the University of Washington. And this is uh, this patient's um, outcome scores. Uh, each first line represents a day. Uh, and you can see her leg pain, uh, she had a little flare up on the right side, every solve. Her back pain is getting a little bit better. Um, and then, um, you know, very minimal intake of opioids here for the, just for the first couple of days. So I think a really, really nice outcome. And again, uh, we'll have a CT scan for you available that I can hopefully show in a couple of months for you guys. Um, another case here uh, right now, which is uh, the last case here right now, um, he's a, 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 was a professional biker um, and um, had this chronic uh, right radicular pain, uh, had an extensive, extensive workup, including PET scans, uh, blocks. Um, and eventually uh, we agreed that this hemangioma that he had there in L5, right in front of this crossing L5 nerve root, uh, may contribute to this chronic, chronic pain that he had. So it was not like, uh, you know, really sort of a, excruciating 10 out of 10 pain, but chronic two to three pains. And then he had these episodes of sharp shooting, shooting pains um, every now and then. And so he had to stop cycling. Uh, he had to stop doing all these things. And so then we came forward and we're like, well, I think what is what happens if we free up the nerve root and resect that um, lesion right adjacent to the nerve root? And so that's what we did. Um, see if I can start this video. So we have an interlaminar approach. Um, and I'll orange you a little bit. So here is, um, here's the lateral aspect here right now. And so we perform basically a, a hemi laminotomy. You can see the facet point there. Here's rostral, here's caudal. We're identifying the neural elements here. That is uh, the L5 nerve root. Here's the disc, the four five disc coming into view. Uh, we're preparing, uh, again, epidural fat and we're finding the posterior aspect of uh, the L5 vertebral body. So you get an X-ray where you can see we have an osteotome, and so we start working around that lesion. Medialize the nerve root, use osteotomes, as you can see there, going in with the osteotome, and then have this uh, hemangioma, so now as one block, and mobilize it. And that's exactly where the video fails. There you go. Huh. There we go. Let's see if it keeps going. So here we mobilize the hemangioplastoma. Wow. Sorry, hemangioma, sorry. Hemangioma, right? Yep, sorry. Hemangioma, mobilize it. And again, we're very close. Pay attention to how close we are to the disc here. And so that made, came into the treatment decision. Now we just basically uh, re resected anything that looked uh, like pathology with the high-speed burr. And again, the disc is up here. And so for that reason, I really wanted to rebuild wow. that, uh, that area. And let's go back here uh, to that. Just picture the last picture. It sort of jumped off quickly. Uh, so you can see that we reconstructed that uh, area. Anyway, so we refilled uh, that area of L5 uh, with magnetos. Uh, and the reason for doing so is so that he's not going to have that weak spot. He wants to go back to biking um, and, uh, and doing his sports. So we, uh, we used it as reconstituting that uh, area. And I can, he's only now, he's not two weeks out. Uh, his leg pain is getting slowly better. So he has already had 50% improvement and I think he will hopefully uh, get better there. As you can see, always encouraging how, you can see how the patient is starting to walk much more. And so functionally, he's already much better than before. 
Um, and so again, uh, online follow up, and I'm happy to show you what he's doing today. Uh, and then I think here is uh, a little bit of an example, just a practical example video, if I can find that. Uh, what I meant before, so you have these little really small funnels, and uh, you have to bring that bone in there. And again, the working corridors for minimal invasive and endoscopic spine surgery are very narrow. Um, and so it makes uh, a big difference to be able to deliver the graft into the area. Um, and so having that consistency and having that very standardized bone graft makes a difference. Again, small nuances, um, but it makes 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 a big difference. Um, now again, we are evaluating this product uh, and have been able to really reduce uh, the utilization of other bone grafts and, and substitutes at the University of Washington. Um, and uh, again, the administrators don't want to hear it, but we are saving a tremendous amount of money by doing so. Uh, so I think, Jens, I mean, um, thanks for inviting me. I think this is really important for surgeons to stand up and like really put our foot down with technologies. You know, there's this uh, notion that technology only increases cost. Uh, and I think that's just not the case. Uh, so we are going to evaluate this in a year from now, we'll have solid data and then we'll make a decision from there. So uh, gets us to the last slide um, where it asks you to take credit, I guess. Um, so there's a QR code um, and Kate, do you wanna? Say yeah, some? I just want wanted to. Yeah. Do you wanna come up front with him or do you wanna? Oh, yeah. sure. Either or, yeah. Okay, yep, I'll come up. You can go to the next. Oh, there's another thank you slide here. I think there's, a, yeah. Oh, that's, that, 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 that's simple enough for me. I'll do this one and you can do this one. Well, I actually wanted to touch on one last thing because um, I wanted to give everybody our indications because um, there's some funnel work there and I just wanted to make sure that we're on label here. So we have four, like I said, we're super scientific focused. So every time we get data, we take it back to the FDA and get our new clearances and indications. So we have four formulations and they all have different indications at this point. So the granules can be used standalone, posterior lateral spine, so cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, as well as pelvis and extremities. The putty can be used as an extender in the posterior lateral spine, so cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, and then standalone in the pelvis and extremities. The Easy Pack Putty, which is a softer version, comes in a, um, a syringe, is to be used as an extender in the posterior lateral spine, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. And we have a collagen product called Flex Matrix, which is meant to be hydrated with BMA. And again, that's posterior lateral spine. But I just wanted to clarify, because I know he has some pictures of funnels and things up there, and I wanted to make sure everybody knows where it's going. So great talk. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank so, you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Sage and Hofstetter. And over 250 viewers live. Uh, Concur. Here's a question for you. So Dr. Faiz Ali Shah wanted to know if your magnet Oz studies are registered in clinicaltrials.gov. Yeah, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you will see um, several studies from us, um, from both Magnetos and then another product that we have in um, FDA phase two right now. And what do they look at? So they're all, right now they're all posterior lateral fusions because that's so what So what do they search for? Oh, um, Curos. Or magnetos. K U R O S. Yes, K U R O S. So the yes. catchwords will trigger. Yes, K U R O S. Yeah. There um, should be, I think, like five. As a spine surgeon, so we are obviously exposed to a lot of companies that uh, promote uh, a variety of uh, bone products and bone substitutes. It's a hot market with significant um, gains potential. One thing that I've seen a lot, and having participated in several previous studies is that when we have something that looks osteodense on imaging, even on CTs, and then when we have to somehow re-intervene, re uh, it's like a mineralized gristle, but it's not remodeled bone. Yes. And if you go back to one of your histology slides on the animal models, where you had the muscle pouch model, I believe it was a canine model. Yeah. Um, my question there is, uh, if, we, if I'm very strict, um, go forward. So um, no, keep going forward. We have to get. Uh, this is sheep. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Oh, that's a that's an ovine model. Good. Top right was the Magnetos product. Yep. If I look at that and compare it to Autograph, and if I was very critical, but some people accuse me to be too critical, um, is this remodeled bone? I mean, on the top left, you see what I uh, uh, consider remodeled bone. On the right, I see 
osteoid and small insular aggregates. Is that remodeled bone? So, there's, so this is at 12 weeks and there is still some bone graft left, but we do continue to track in these ovine models over periods past 12 weeks um, to make sure that we do completely resorb and remodel into, into mature lamellar bone. So, you know, that's, that's why we did all of these sheep and animal studies is for that exact reason. We didn't want to be a bone graft that looks great on x-rays and CTs, but then when you go in to revise, you're pulling out, you know, chalk. Um, so that was one of the ways that we were trying, you know, really trying to, to make sure that we had, you know, a product that doesn't do that. As a bone healing specialist, would you agree that peak, so plastic, uh, ethyl ketone, ketone, is one of the worst biomaterial <laughs> reading question? Um, I, I don't know if I can give a, a best and a worst, but there, there's, there's certainly materials that are far better at promoting osteoinductive than, than other materials. Let's say conductive, but like titanium conductive. versus peak, all things being equal, would you agree titanium is way better? Yeah, I would. I was at a meeting recently, and I did not know, I must confess, of M1 versus M2 immune modulators. And there's a company that now claims that they have a negatively electrically charged uh, peak product. Does that make sense? They claim that they can get M2 induction through negative electronically charged peak molecules. That's interesting. I mean, I'd love to see their literature. I will say that we were the first company that really figured out this mechanism of action specifically in a bone graft for M2 macrophages. Um, like I said, there, there's been a lot um, published by this PhD researcher at Mayo named Charles Mills. Um, so he put a lot of the literature out there in terms of uh, macrophage polarization and specifically looking at how M2 macrophages are involved in this bony induction pathway. Can you go back a couple slides? There was this beautiful mesenchymal cell picture where mesenchymal cells, yes, fantastic picture. Take us to the first 24 hours on a bioimplant as a human being. What is the first cell that actually catches on a, a bone graft? So this, so this is a bench top model. This isn't in, in a in a person. Um, but so the first thing that happens is you have tissue trauma, whether it's from you know actual trauma or surgical trauma, and you have this influx of immune cells that come to the site of tissue, and they're they're all the um, immune cells that we learn about, like basophils, um, mono, monocytes, eosinophils, um, all of these come, and they all have a role to play, whether it's you know phagocytizing bacteria or um, you know necrotic cells, or starting to signal to mesenchymal stem cells, not just for bony induction pathway, but for angiogenesis and others, right? So there's all these cells. That that come and they start determining their lineages and start um, telling mesenchymal stem cells where to go and, and, and how to you know, start this regeneration process. Um, we specifically looked at the bone, bone regeneration process. We, we do have some literature, again, published looking at that angiogenic pathway too, because there's, there's some um, proteins that are secreted by M2 macrophages that are involved in angiogenesis. So I can give you that paper if you'd like it as well. I'll watch a replay of your answer <laughs> because my brain is still scrambling. Um, but uh, is it true or not that the first cells that attach to a new biosurface are fibroblasts? I, I, I can't say 100% for certain, but they are amongst one of the very first. Yes, absolutely. So the conversion of fibroblast, assuming that it's a majority, let's just assume for argument's sake it's 85% plus of the initial cell attachment of fibroblasts. When and how and where does the conversion of fibroblasts to mesenchymal cell cells that are neoproliferative in an osteogenic pathway, when does that occur? So we wanna start even before that pathway. So an M1 macrophage is gonna promote that fibroblast proliferation. The M2 pathway is gonna start pushing that preosteoblastic. So our mechanism of action will start even kind of before that the fibroblasts start to lay down. But you're right, if M1 macrophages are the dominant subtype for more than 72 hours, it's a really good indicator that there's gonna be a, a, a fibroblastic, you know, scar tissue kind of formation on, on that surface. So the main point that I'm gathering from you is the actual pathway towards bone healing starts with an inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. And that is mediated by having a vascular environment, right? Yes. So the more Part vascularity we have around our implant, the better we are. Yeah, or right? just on, on host tissue. So that is true in general, but in terms for us specifically, if there's host tissue present, then you can get that monocyte cell lineage to polarize to M2 macrophages. So, um, we, you know, we always say just put magnetos on, you know, on host tissue um, because that's how the mechanism of action is going to work. Don't don't put something else down first and then magnetos on top of it because at that point it's farther away from host tissue. I'm learning a lot from you and Dr. Hofstetter, uh, oh, so okay. I thank you for being here. Okay. Uh, any other comments from you and Chris? I don't, I don't. No, 
I think you you summarized nicely. Just one one little um, you know kind of interesting uh, tidbit oh, I... there in terms of research. So uh, a couple of years ago, with Buddy Ratner, who is a uh, a really amazing scientist at UW, we used surface technology to induce M2 in spinal cord injuries. And same pathway. I think it's a pro healing pathway, and that needs to happen for regeneration. Great. Well, learned a lot. Of great, <laughs> great discussions. I I have to go uh, to another meeting, so I apologize. I could talk all day, but thanks for coming. Thank you.